Okay, thank you everybody uh, for bearing with uh, the various technical issues um, that many students had to deal with and teachers had to deal with over the last few years. Um, my name is Jason. I'm the uh, Associate Director of Digital Strategy at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is based in San Francisco. Um, we focus on protecting uh, digital rights around the world. Um, and I specifically focus some of my time at EFF on um, how those rights are being protected or limited in schools. So a lot of what uh, Leonie just discussed, I'm gonna go through a little bit of that, although um, there are a lot of things to be worried about when it comes to digital privacy uh, in schools these days. Um, so uh, just enumerating some of the rights that we kind of think about at the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, and how those rights are kind of being uh, uh, how they're important to students. Um, so privacy, transparency, creativity, and free speech are kind of the way we imagine the the list of rights that we focus on. They overlap, of course. Um, you know, often things that impact privacy also uh, impact free speech. And um, I won't read through this, but um, generally speaking, we just believe that students should be safe to uh, use technology without their data being collected and um, uh, that's what we try to fight for at EFF. Um, so I'm just going to list kind of the, the these rights and some of the individual dangers that we see um, currently, uh, some of which Leonie mentioned um, and the previous presenter as well. Um, and uh, some of these problems, of course, overlap, right? Again, if, if something impacts student privacy, it sometimes impacts free speech. So uh, you all are familiar, of course, with data mining education tools. Um, these have uh, been a problem for decades now, and um, you know that's part of the reason we're having this this whole conference. Um, uh, there's a serious problem that developed during the pandemic with remote or algorithmic proctoring, uh, because of the amount of data that those apps collect. They're intended, of course, to determine whether or not a student is cheating in some way, or they, they flag students if they're um, looking away from the screen. But to do this, they collect video of the student room, the student face, um, student citizenship information, um, all sorts of information which they then hold for upwards of years, for, for several years in some cases, um, unfortunately. And we see this as a continuing problem because even though um, uh, the pandemic is over, uh, a lot of students are back in schools, uh, these tools are going to continue to be used. Um, another problem that Leonie mentioned is what we call student activity monitoring apps or spyware, student spyware apps. Um, she mentioned GoGuardian. There are a host of these tools, GoGuardian, Gaggle, Bark, Lightspeed, Securely. Um, these are in place in, in tens of thousands of schools, um, in the US at least. Um, and these tools, uh, are intended for student safety. Um, so what they're intended to do is um, monitor what students look up on their computers, monitor uh, documents that they write, videos that they watch, images that they look at, and um, alert schools, uh, administrators or teachers, to some of those things that the students are looking at if they believe that they're dangerous in some way. Um, but what ends up happening is these are all using algorithms, which are not very sophisticated. And so they uh, flag LGBTQ plus students. They flag people looking up. Uh, if you're interested in the U.S. in, in gun rights or uh, gun laws, they might flag you for looking those things up it doesn't really matter which side of the political spectrum you're on, that you'll be flagged when these keywords pop up. And sometimes that information goes to a teacher, sometimes it goes to a parent, and um, it limits what students are able to do on their computers. And lastly, social media monitoring apps, which are not in huge use yet, but um, we have seen the growing use of them as schools worry, especially about um, cyber bullying or um, potential dangers in the school, like from school shootings. Um, there's a growing use of these apps that monitor social media platforms where students expect to be, um, you know, not 
viewed by their schools. Um, and so they're talking about whatever it is that students talk about. And sometimes that information ends up going out to the school and um, endangering students because of that. Um, so what's making things better? <laughs> uh, there are some laws restricting the data collection and, uh, and sale uh, of it in the US and of course, across the, the world. Um, Leonie mentioned that some of these laws don't have strong in enforcement um, and that's a big problem. We in California were working on a law that would limit the collection of data by uh, remote proctoring companies and it's currently in the legislature, uh, but they've removed the uh, private right of action um, so that it doesn't have nearly as strong enforcement and a parent or a student can't sue the proctoring company if they violate the law. Um, obviously, open education suites and tools are part of why we're here. Really glad that people are working on these. Um, they're an important response to the kind of uh, for-profit ed tech tools that are um, in use most of the time now. And lastly, we've seen a lot of student activism over the pandemic, especially from students who were rallying together to kind of try to uh, stop data collection, and in particular from remote proctoring. Um, what about dangers to transparency? Well, a lot of these tools, uh, these, these dangers overlap, right? But other uh, dangers, algorithmic grading tools have become an issue. Um, this was a big problem in the UK. Um, a few years ago. These tools don't allow students to know what data is collected about them and how it's used. And that's why it's a danger to transparency. If students can't determine uh, what information was used to figure out that according to a computer they were cheating, they can't fight back against it, right? When you don't know what information uh, Microsoft is collecting or Google is collecting, you can't fight back about it. And when you don't know that there is a tool on your computer that monitors um, different aspects of what you're doing online or even just on your device, uh, you can't fight back about it. So it's uh, important that those tools be more transparent, but that's not their interest, of course. Um, of course, what's helping when it comes to transparency, the open education resources and tools that everyone here has kind of been talking about, um, and also, uh, just thinking about how to educate students on how algorithms and artificial intelligence work. Um, on EFF's podcast, we spoke with uh, Aura Tanner, who works on something called the AI Education Project uh, in the US, which is a growing kind of set of curricula for educating young people on how artificial intelligence functions, uh, how it's used in criminal justice systems, how it's used in schools. Um, you can find more information about those uh, some, of, some, of the, some of those curricula which are available if you look up the AI education catalog um, on Google or not Google, DuckDuckGo or uh, <laughs> search engine of choice. Um, what are the dangers to student creativity? Well, when we see, when we think of creativity here again, at EFF, we think of the ability to use technology safely and to build on it. Um, We've seen a lot of schools uh, use what are, we call, I guess, one-to-one -one laptop programs where schools issue devices to students, which can be really beneficial. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those devices are restricted. And we heard from um, the founder of an organization called Hack Club, which is a coding resource for young people, that a lot of students who are trying to learn how to code can't do it properly because they have a, their only device is a restricted Chromebook, which, for example, doesn't have the ability to right click. Um, that means that it's managed in a certain way so that certain aspects are restricted. So you can't look into the code of a website or get different examples of how things work when you when you can't use the, the software fully um, or the hardware fully. And of course, those student activity monitoring tools that we mentioned, GoGuardian, Gaggle, um, are also blocking tools. They don't just monitor what students look up, they also block huge amounts of information. The Internet Archive, for example, has had problems with this. EFF's own website, um, we've looked at lists of sites that have been blocked and those that have been whitelisted. And sometimes teachers have to whitelist what should be very obvious sites like um, uh, all sorts of nonprofits <laughs> without going into detail. Um, very quickly, uh, improving culture of creativity. One-to-one -one laptop, 
laptop programs do help students, right? Even though sometimes those devices are managed and um, troublesome because of their restrictions, it does help. Obviously, a growth in high-speed internet has been a, a benefit. Um, those education tools for AI that I mentioned. And also we've seen, especially in higher education, the growth of VR tools, um, virtual reality tools that are giving students in some schools that might not have the ability to have a cadaver lab to study um, biology, to study chemistry, uh, the ability to do so. But they're small and uh, we're a little worried they'll be co-opted by some of the large VR companies like Facebook's Meta um, but they are a positive move. Um, and lastly, the dangers to student free speech. I've mentioned all of these before, the data mining suites, the student activity monitoring and blocking tools, and the social media monitoring apps. Um, a lot of these things make it so that students can't look certain things up that they'd like to, uh, and that they're in danger of doing so. But again, what's helping students in this way, uh, the fact that they can look things up from home, that they have uh, high-speed internet at home or at school in general when schools aren't uh, restricting their devices. That curriculum on AI that I mentioned is helping students learn how to um, speak out about misuse of AI. And those one-to-one -one laptop programs are making it so the students can share and create information online um, as long as those devices aren't restricted and tools aren't being used to chill their speech. Um, I think that's everything for me. Thank you so much.